Amen. Well, are you glad to be in church? Say amen. Amen. And the choir is up again. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Genesis chapter 22 is where I want to invite your attention for a little while tonight. Genesis chapter number 22. And I want to thank you again for so many of you being here. And uh, first and foremost, let me once again say thank you, Clearbrook Baptist, for allowing me to be here and uh, for being uh bendable and moldable and moving around and, and, and moving and getting chairs out and all of that. I know it's a little warm in here and stuff, but thank you for allowing me to be here. It's truly an honor. And then thank all of you. If you weren't here last night, but you are here tonight, would you raise your hand if you realize you're here tonight? Oh, wow. Look at that. That's uh, about more than half the crowd. So thank you so very much for being back. And uh, just a moment, I'm going to pray and we're going to chit chat and preach the word of God out of Genesis chapter 22. But do pray for me and Brother Wayne tonight as we head back to Nashville. It's not that long of a drive. We gain an hour and so we're time travelers and so we'll get back at a at a decent time and uh, we have our Wednesday night uh, tomorrow night and uh, the Lord's just been doing some extraordinary things uh, in our ministry and, and many of you know that because you follow us on Facebook and YouTube and uh, little would we have ever known that 18 to 20 months ago uh, God was going to do what he's done and raise up the platform internationally that he has uh, for our little church when people come to our church because we have such nice live streaming and we do such big camera work it looks like a you know a a, a production on ESPN or P, uh, ESPN or something like that, and, and it looks like we got like 40 million people that are watching and in the building, and then they drive up, and there's this little wedding chapel <laughs> on Old Lebanon Dirt Road, right? It's like a poke and plum area. You poke your head around a corner, you're plum out of the area, right? And people just... <laughs> And they drive over and they're like, this is not this guy's church, right? And then they walk in and, you know, they got Saturday night service. And then we got 8.30 Sunday morning, 10 o'clock Sunday morning, 11.30 Sunday morning. And I preach all four services back to back. We never would have imagined that. I still remember we were meeting in a storefront with 30 people on Easter morning, right? Just begging for God to do something. And then he used something as ridiculous as Facebook. You know, he used something technologically, you know, and so just to, it took our whole church to a whole new level and our ministry and my life to a whole new level. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't understand it. Uh, we do a lot of interviews because of it and all of that. And, and every time somebody asks me about it, I'm like, listen, I am a hillbilly from Nashville, Tennessee, and I never looked for any of this. And God just did it. And to God be the glory, great things he has done. And, you know, it is amazing how and where we can share the gospel if we'll just be faithful. Because I want to tell you something, Paul rotten away in a prison cell said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that still saves sinners, puts marriages back together, and breaks bondages and addictions and gross churches. It is the power of the word of God. So I don't care if I'm doing it, he's doing it, or he's doing it tomorrow night, you hear me. It is not the man, it is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm glad you're here, but if you just drove a long ways to hear a guy preach, then you're going to be sorely disappointed. But if you're here because you want the Spirit of God to use the Word of God in your life, then you're in the right place tonight. I guarantee you that. So let's pray, and we'll jump right into Genesis 22. Father, I'm grateful for all these folks that are here, and thank you again for this dear man of God inviting me to his platform in this church. Now, Father, I need you, and I'd be an arrogant fool to admit otherwise. And so I pray that you will do tonight what Greg Locke cannot do. Thank you for all of these folks that are here. And, Lord, every single one of us, from the oldest to the youngest, whether they belong to this church or whatever church, we're here for one reason. We are hungry for truth. And so I pray that you would manifest your presence in this place. I pray that you would remove distractions so that we may focus by faith on what you have for us tonight over the course of these next few moments. And, Lord, I pray that this would be the catalyst of doing great and mighty things in this church and in every church that's represented. May all of these men of God that stood around the room a moment ago, may they leave this building lit up by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and go back and turn their churches and their towns upside down with the glory of the word of God. So do a work tonight. We're going to thank you for it. We're going to honor you for it. And we're going to give you all credit and all control because you deserve every ounce of it in Jesus' name. And the church said... In Genesis chapter 22, we have a very interesting story that many of us understand historically about the offering of Abraham's son, Isaac, on the altar. Now, before we get there, I want to kind of back up historically and kind of set the tone, if you will, for what led him up to this unbelievable moment of worship and truth in the 22nd chapter. Many of you know that in Genesis chapter 12, we meet up with Abraham for the first time. Before he's actually Abraham, he's just Abram. And he and his wife, 
wife, Sarah, are called by God, whom I must remind you they did not even know, recognize, or understand because Abraham was from a family of paganism. They knew nothing about the Jehovah God of the Bible that we celebrate and worship in this room tonight. And so God came to Abraham and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get up, don't ask me any questions, and I want you to go to a place and guess what? You don't need a GPS navigational device. I'll tell you when you get there. And Hebrews 12 says that he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, and the Bible says that he went out not knowing whether he went. Now, time out, friend. If you and I are called by God to do something extraordinarily faith-filled like that today, it's okay when you go home and tell your friends. It might be pretty cool if you go to church and tell all of them. But try going home and telling mama that. Hey, I sold everything. I quit my job and we're leaving today. God's called me to a full-time ministry. And she's like, God's called you to be a full-time moron. Have you lost your mind? <laughs> you can't do this. And by the way, when he said God called me, she's like, uh... Who? They had absolutely no idea what they were getting involved in, and yet by faith he went out. And two times because of his faith, the Bible says that Abraham was the friend of God. Now, neighbor, I would rather be the friend of God than have anybody else's approval whatsoever in my life. And so he went out not even knowing what he was doing. And so for years they prayed and they prayed and they prayed that God would give them a child. They prayed for a son. Abraham wanted to pass down that godly heritage that he was learning for all of those decades and all of those years, but they couldn't have a son. But you remember one day they were in their tent and two angels showed up and said, we need to talk to you, Abram. Come on outside the tent while your wife's in there cooking a meal. And he came out and they began to say, you're probably not going to believe this, but your wife is going to conceive and bear a child. And you are going to have the promised seed, and I'm going to bless you, God says, so wonderfully that the stars of heaven and the sand of the seashore cannot compare to the great heritage that I'm going to leave you. I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And you better know something. God is still very much on the side of the nation of Israel. Can I get a witness tonight? And thank God we've got somebody with some courage and a backbone in the White House that will stand up and stand out and stand for the nation of Israel. Because when America turns on Israel, America will be in the sewer dump of history. All right? Now, that was free. Wasn't even in the message. But nonetheless, <laughs> God said, I'm going to do it. Abraham said, I'm having a hard time believing that. But he said, here's why. Biologically, he said, it's impossible. He said, I'm 100 years old. Now, his wife, Sarah, was 90. But here's what he said. And let me tell you, fellas, here's a great rule of thumb. He made sure she was in the tent when he said this. <laughs> He said, my wife is old and well stricken. <laughs> if she had been around, he would have been well stricken across the face, I can guarantee you. <laughs> so careful what you say. And so she actually overhears it and she laughs within herself. And he said, no, you are going to have a baby. So they thought by that, that okay, God's going to have a baby through us, but maybe we've got to figure it out on our own. So they took the promise from God and they did something fleshly. And you remember, she was able to take Abraham and give him over to Hagar, their handmaid, their servant. And he went in, lay with her, and she bore Ishmael. And they took the promise of God and in a fleshly way, they tried to fulfill it themselves. And I'm telling you something, when God gives you a vision, don't try to figure it out. Let God do it through you or you'll mess it up every single time. You will jack up the wisdom of God if you try to do it in the energy and strength and power of your flesh. And by the way, did you know that because of that disobedience, as good and sincere as it seemed, that's why we have the Middle Eastern crisis right this very moment, right this very second. Ishmael and Isaac have been fighting for generations. Always have been and they always will be because Abraham jacked things up when he took God's wisdom and vision and he tried to fulfill it in the energy of his flesh. So finally, God does give them Isaac, the darling apple of Abraham's eye. I mean, you talk about a father-son relationship like no other in the entire continuity of the Word of God. These guys did everything together. And when we get to Genesis chapter 22, Isaac's not in diapers, 
I know sometimes we use that, you know, as far as an analogy. Here's this little bitty tiny baby bebopping around with a pacifier and diapers on. No, no, we're talking about a, a, a well older teenage young man. He's called a lad. This guy's up there. He's probably 17, 18, 19 years of age when we finally get to Genesis chapter 22. And God is going to ask Abraham to do the absolute unthinkable. Look what the Bible says in verse number one. And it came to pass. My grandfather used to say that's the greatest promise in the whole Bible. It never comes to stick around. Thank God it always comes to pass. Amen. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. Now, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible circle or underscore the word tempt, it doesn't mean that God tempted him to sin. It literally means that God was going to send a temptation, some trouble into his life. And how many of you know, I don't care how much you read the Bible, how much you fast, how much you pray, how many verses you have memorized, sometimes the bottom is going to fall out of both ends of your boat. God allows trials, struggles, and temptation so that he can deepen us. Everybody wants the power, but nobody wants the process. And temptation is the reality of that process. My troubles have come and my troubles have gone and more trouble is on the way. One thing is for sure, my troubles endure for my trouble will meet me today. So often I've tried just simply to hide my face from its long gazing stare. Yet running my best from east to the west, I find that my trouble's still there. From dusk until dawn, my troubles roll on and it seems that my troubles won't end. But then as I look in the words of God's book, I find there that trouble's my friend. You see, God does not use trouble and instability to hurt us and harm Harden us, but to help us and to deepen us. And he came to this man of faith and he tempted him. And here's what he said, Abraham. And he said, behold, here I am. I love how eager he is. Every time God calls him, he's like, oh, pick me, pick me, pick me. He's right there, Johnny, on the spot. Verse two. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. You notice the qualifying phrase there? Not just a kid, not just another mouth to feed, not just an insurance liability, the kid that you love with all of your heart, the one that you fish with, hike with, ride bikes with, love and do all of these things. You stay up late into the night getting to know each other, this boy that you have prayed for for decades, the boy that you love. I want you to get thee in the land of Moriah and offer him, your kid, there in the land of Moriah for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, sometimes we read things in the Bible and we think, well, that can't be that big of a deal. But we have to back up and understand that a burnt offering was not your average nominal offering on Sunday to God. This was not just passing the plate and putting a five in it. The burnt offering was the most violent and vicious offering of the entire Old Testament sacrificial system. He was going to have to chop his son up into itty bitty pieces and then burn him as a sweet-smelling savor to God. And I'm going to tell you, when I read that, that boggles my mind. But that's why he's God in the relationship and I'm not. Some time ago, I was at the Mall of America. Anybody ever been there? It's a great big, huge mall. If I never go again, it'll be too soon. Praise God. <laughs> and this guy come walking by and he had a shirt on. It said, two things are true in life, dot, dot, dot. Well, that made me want to turn around and look at the back of the guy's shirt to see what the dot, dot, dot was all about. So I'm thinking, okay, two things are true in life. He walked by and it said, number one, there is a God. Number two, you are not him. <laughs> Amen to that, right? Sometimes Greg Locke tries to play God and it turns out to be a debacle at the end of the day. And so Abraham is told by God, I want you to take your son, chop him up, and burn him as a sacrifice. Now I'm going to tell you, that is very hard to take. That is extraordinarily difficult to even read and fathom. But then keep noticing what happens. Verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning. What? I believe I'd have slept in that day. <laughs> I'm just telling you how carnal I am. He just said, I want you to take your son that you love with all of your heart. He's the bebopping glory of your life. And I want you to go to a mountain. And I want you to leave tomorrow. And I want you to kill him. I would have faked a sickness the next morning when I woke up. But he doesn't. This guy's so eager to obey God, even in the most difficult set of circumstances, he gets up extra early to do what God tells him to do. Wasn't no laying around on Sunday morning till the sun warmed his feet. Wasn't no hitting the snooze button and resetting the iPhone, right? He got up and did exactly what God told him to do the night before. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. And he saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. 
And Isaac, his son, and he clave the wood for the burnt offering. And he rose up and he went, watch this, unto the place. Did you notice that? The specific destination, not a place. It wasn't some random place that he picked on a map and just threw a dart at it. It was the very place. And I remind you in verse 2, he said the land of Moriah. You're going to see that twice. It's very important to the historical narrative. And so he says to the very place of a mountain which I will tell you of. I will give you the specific destination point when you get there. You don't know it now. You don't need to know it now. But you go to the very place. And the Bible says that he went to where God had told him. Now you talk about obedience. You know, we tell our kids all the time, obedience is the very best way. I came to preach, not sing, but nonetheless, you understand, obedience is what God is asking for tonight. You see, let me tell you what my kids can't stand. And if you have kids, you help me and amen me on this. My kids can't stand it when I say, because I said so. <laughs> you got them too, right? They hate that. But in my house, I call it the golden rule. He that make it the gold, make it the rule. Say amen right there, right? <laughs> You burn my gas, you eat my food, you wear my clothes, you sleep in my bed, you're going to do what I say, ladies and gentlemen. And so this guy does not ask any questions. He just obeys simply because God said so. He's not like, well, you know, God, there probably is a better way. Let's come up with an alternative way. Let's justify this, yada, yada, shmada. No, he got up early and he obeyed during the most difficult day of his life. I'm not saying that he got a good night's sleep. I won't even pretend to think that he got a good night's sleep. He tossed and turned, had basketball-sized ulcers, and I'm telling you, he had heartburn and headache chewing his fingernails to the quick. He was a wreck. So how do you know? Because he was a man like us, and I'd have been a wreck, right? And again, I've already told you, I'd have slept in. I'm just saying right now, I'd have slept in for a week, neighbor, and thought about this whole thing, right? But he doesn't. He gets up, and he takes him to the very place where God says. Now, verse 4, check this out. Then on the third day, so they have this little journey that's taking place, and they got these servants and the donkey. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw, here's the next two words, the place. Uh, don't ever miss that definite article. The place, not a place, the very spot. God said, that's it, son. That is the intended destination. And when he saw the place afar off, verse 5, Abraham said unto his young men, so he says to the servants, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. So he looks at his servants that are there and he says, you boys stay with the extra tent and the grip and all the hiking stuff and you stay here with the donkey. Me and my boy are going to go yonder. Okay, he's pointing. We're going to go yonder and notice what the Bible says they're going to do and worship. Now you got to pay real close attention to that detail right here in the text of the Word of God. He said, we are going to worship. Now, question. Did Isaac at this point in the context know what his father had planned? No. But he said what they had planned was to go worship. Now, I don't know how in the world, humanly speaking, he could say we're going to worship God in the mountain when he knew good and jolly well he was going to butcher his kid and burn him as a smelling sacrifice to the God that he was serving at this point in his life. And he said, we're going to go worship now, there's something interesting about this word worship, not only in its immediate context, it's the simple fact it's the first time the word worship's ever used in the Bible. The word worship is used many times in the Bible. I, I went to Bible college in Shelby, North Carolina, and I did go to one. You'll hear me preach one time and deny that reality, but nonetheless, I went to one. And when I was in hermeneutics class, the proper interpretation of the scriptures, they taught me the law of the first mention principle, right? Whenever something is mentioned the first time in the Bible, it cohesively within unity means the same thing in that context throughout the whole Bible. So the first time the word worship is mentioned, there are no harps. And wasn't that beautiful tonight? There were no guitars. There were no beautiful young ladies singing songs in front of a crowd bigger than they've ever sung in front of before. There was no piano, okay? There was no screens. There was no hymn book, and yet he just said worship. You see, we are skewed when it comes to our thinking of what worship is. You see, how we sing is the expression of our worship, but it is not worship itself. Some people sing right out of a hymn book. 
Some people sing off the screens. Some people sing slower. Some people sing faster. Uh, some people are a little more traditional. Some people are a little more blended. Some people are a little more contemporary. And we talk about the fact, oh, that's how we worship. No, it's not. That's how we express our worship. Right. Worship is not instruments. Right, worship is not even being in this building tonight. We say, welcome to the worship service. This is an expression of our worship within the service, you understand. But singing is not worship. He says nothing about any of that right here. This isn't a soul winning passage. It's not a bus ministry passage. It's not a Bible conference passage. It's not a missionary passage. It's a guy that's going to kill his kid passage. And the first thing he says is, hey, we're going to go on the mountain. We're going to worship. You know why? Because worship at the very heart is nothing more than obedience to the Spirit of God. That is worship. You see, I don't care what you sing. If you don't worship God, I'm telling you, you are as dry as a bird's nest. It doesn't matter what our churches sing. The average church in America don't have a whole, enough Holy Ghost fire to blow the fuzz off a small peanut. You know why? It's not just because we're boring. It's because we think worship is how we sing when worship has nothing to do with what and how we sing. It has everything to do with are we obeying the Spirit of God? Are we living in absolute, utmost abandonment and obedience to the Spirit of Almighty God? Obedience is not a song, or worship is not a song service. It is obedience to the God within you. And he said, me and my boy, we're going to go worship. Now, here's what even gets me. Look at verse 5 again. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and, notice that bridge building word, come again to you. Now notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, well, we're going to go worship and I'm going to come back. No, in the same breath, he said, we're going to go worship and we're going to come back. Are you kidding me? He was probably nervous even saying it. You know, he's got everything he needs to butcher his kid, literally. And he said, well, we're going to go worship God. And then me and the lad that goes to worship God, we're both going to come back and see you again. Get on the donkey. We're going to ride home. He said, we're both coming back. Because the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 tells us that he so believed in the unbelievable supernatural promises of God that had he killed him on Mount Moriah, God would have resurrected him from the dead to keep his word because Titus 1-2 says God cannot lie. And if God gives you a promise, come hell or high water, it's going to take place no matter what transpires in your life. And he said, me and the boy are going to worship God and we are coming again to you. Verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. And he laid it upon Isaac, his son, so he's carrying it for him. And he took the fire in his hand, so some type of a, a torching device, if you will, and a knife, that's the important instrument. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, now notice the answer, and he said, Here I am, my son. Now you believe anything you want to, but I am fully to the core convinced that this was not only one of the most difficult conversations Abraham ever had with his son, it was probably one of the most stretched out and patient conversations he ever had with his son. And he's like, yes, yeah, yeah, son, how, how can I help you, son? Because he knew this is the finality of our communication and fellowship together. This is it. Okay, whether God resurrects you or not, that wasn't the point. The point is I got to kill you first one way or the other because God said so. And he said, uh, Dad, can I ask you a question? He's like, oh, yes, yeah, son. Yes, yeah, son. You know, sometimes parents, grandparents, I'm talking to myself, I've got four kids. We're too distracted. If we knew it was going to happen around the next curve, we'd be much more patient. If we knew they were going to be at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital with child cancer, we'd be more patient. A couple weeks ago, my little girl, her name's Destiny, and she is a fired up, ridiculous little girl. I was sitting in the house, and I was, I, I was doing some kind of Facebook nonsense, stuff that probably didn't even matter. It was even past time to post videos. So you people keep me up too much at night, praise God. But nonetheless, I had my phone, and Destiny was like, Hey, Daddy. Hey, Daddy. Hmm? Hey, Daddy. She grabbed my hand. She pulled my phone out of my face. She got right up in my face and said, Daddy-o! <laughs> I turned that stupid phone off and we had some Barbie time. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> and we did. I got the G.I. Joes and shot all of them, but nonetheless, we had some Barbie time. Amen. <laughs> Ain't no transgender business going up in my house. Amen. That's <laughs> Boys play with G.I. Joes and girls play with Barbies. You understand that? 
Target's going to get that one figured out one day. But again, that's next year's message. Amen. <laughs> and so I put the phone down. I played with my kid. But if I knew that it was going to happen, I'd be more patient, wouldn't I? If we knew. If, if he would have only known what he was asking his dad. And I think Abraham was drawing that conversation out as long as he possibly could because he knew the end was coming. And the Bible said that Isaac spake unto Abraham and he said, Father, he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? By the way, that's a super legitimate question, right? Yeah. And, and I think he was asking it in a respectful way to not make his daddy seem like he's senile and he forgot stuff. He's like, you know, Dad, uh, we got the wood and got the ropes and uh, we got the knife, we got the fire, but <laughs> I'll be, <laughs> we don't have the most important thing. <laughs> Okay, sorry, my phone's not working. No eBay out here, you know. <laughs> Where's the lamb? <laughs> now, let me tell you something that I think. Now, this is lockology, not theology, so don't split the church over. Here's what I think. I don't think Sarah knew where they were because mama wasn't going to have that. Oh, you going where? You going to do what? I'm popping out babies at 90 years old and you going to kill them when they're 15? Are you kidding me? <laughs> We didn't go through all that nonsense for nothing, right? So I, I don't think she knew where they were at this particular point. He purposely had no cell service, right? None. He was some sketchy stuff going on. And so he says, where's the lamb, right? I, I, we need a lamb, Lord. I mean, uh, God, what, what, what's the Lord going to do with the lamb? How, how are we going to get it? I love his response. This is crazy. If you don't get anything else I say, watch verse 8. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So, what happens? They went both of them together. All right, let's throw the Jake brakes on. Slow this thing down. This is very important. Let me tell you what the Bible didn't say. It does not say when he asked the question, God will provide for himself a lamb. Now, was God going to provide for himself a lamb? Yeah, he certainly did, but that's not what he said. You know, the Bible says that not even knowing it, Abraham preached the gospel. This is when he did that. He prophetically said something he did not even understand in his own spirit. He had no idea who Jesus was. He had no idea how he was going to show up in the line of the Messiah. He had no idea who Jesus was going to be. He, he looked forward to something we're looking back to, and he looked forward with anticipation, and we look back sometimes with disgust and laziness, and we know how the thing turns out. And he doesn't say God will provide for himself a lamb, although he did that. He said God will provide himself a lamb. And do you not remember, oh, John the Baptist, the one man in the Bible with the personality of a rock, preached repentance and everybody in town wanted to hear what the man had to say. You could not have a coffee conversation with John the Baptist. He had no personality whatsoever, but when he hit that rock of a pulpit, he was a wide open individual and all of Jerusalem and all of Judea and all of Samaria and all the regions round about came out to hear this fiery preacher with motorcycle breeches and a double-breasted camel hair's coat and a duck dynasty beard with locust legs and honey coming out of his mouth. <laughs> And so he gets everybody down to the muddy, filthy Jordan River, and he's dunking them left and right. And then all of a sudden in John 1, he sees a slumping figure walking over the horizon. And John pulls that last convert up out of the water, and he says, y'all stop just for a minute. And he gets a little closer, and he walks, and he walks, gets a little closer. And the closer he gets, the closer Jesus gets. And he stops in John 1, and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And at that very moment, Jesus was in divine fulfillment of what this man Abraham said so many centuries earlier. Not that God will provide for himself, but that God himself shall be that sacrificial lamb. And when Jesus died on that cross, you better know something like we sang tonight. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. And the liberal, leftist, modernist churches of the world can take the blood off the wall and the blood out of the hymn books, but it's still the blood of Jesus Christ that saves us from our sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You're not 
not saved because you're a Baptist. You're not saved because you're a Catholic. You're not saved because you're a Methodist. You're not saved because you had some experience. You're not saved because you got goosebumps. You're not saved because you're an Episcopalian. You are saved because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the only agent that cleanses us of our sin, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care how many times you get baptized. I don't care how good you are. Well, I have you know that I'm a working my fingers to the bone. I'll have you know you'll die and go to hell with bony fingers because it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy hath he saved us. You can't be good enough to get to God. You weren't even looking in the first place. And Luke 19, 10 says, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Religion says you got to seek God, seek God, seek God, and you may or may not find him. Christianity says you are dead, doomed, and depraved in your sin. You can't seek God, so he sought you when you couldn't do it. And that's the truth of the gospel. And prophetically, Abraham said to his son, not even knowing what he was meaning, God will provide himself a lamb. And he was the finality of the sacrificial system that went on throughout the Old Testament. You see, the altar in the Old Testament, if it were to speak, if we were to personify the altar tonight in this message, that altar had one word in its vocabulary, sacrifice. Someone says, how come the Old Testament is so violent? I'm going to tell you what, it's a bloodbath. The Old Testament is a bloodbath. And all that altar knew every day, every week, every year, sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Never enough. Not enough blood could be shed. Not enough substitutionary animals could be slain. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. And yet when Jesus says, in John 19, 30, it is finished. He bowed his head. He gave up the ghost. There was a great earthquake. Woke people up out of the graves. And in the Holy of Holies, the Bible says that the veil was rent not from the bottom to top, as man's doing. It was ripped from the top to the bottom. And God said, you can come in because of the shed blood of my son, the Lord Jesus. But you better know something. I don't serve a dead Jew in a Palestinian tomb. I serve a risen Savior up from the grave. He arose with a mighty conqueror of his foes. He arose victorious over the vast domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. Hallelujah. Christ arose. But when Jesus split that veil, supernaturally, that altar learned a new vocabulary word. Satisfied. Satisfied. No more sacrifice. It's satisfied. And notice what happens when he begins to explain this to his son. And they came to the place. Notice that's the third time the place is mentioned. They came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there. And he laid the wood in order. You see, we serve a God of order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now, now wait a minute. We, we've got to develop that just for a second. Just as submissively obedient as Abraham was to God, in the context, I can only denote from a simple reading that Isaac was just that submissive and obedient to his father. He wasn't cussing. What are you doing, old man? I can't believe this. I'm going to call mama right now. She's going to fix this, this this second. I'm going to call the police on you. You ever heard kids say that these days? If I'd have said to my granddaddy, he'd have whooped my tail 15 ways from Sunday. <laughs> I'm like, call the cops, you little brat. Go right ahead. That'd be all right with me, huh? <laughs> and he's not like, I'm going to call the cops. I can't believe this beating on his chest like King Kong. He said, Dad, if that's what God told you to do, here's my hands. Bind me up and put me there. And he bound his kid and he laid him on the altar. And watch what the Bible says. In verse 10 it says, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now we're at a point in the context where it is no turning back. There's no same bat time, same bat channel to be continued. There is no turning back at this point. It is going to end violently. It's going to be bad. As far as Abraham knows, he doesn't know what's about to come. We see what's going to happen. But he had no idea which makes it all the more glorious because we know God stops him, but he had no idea and he was going to follow through with it because he loved God more than he loved his kid. And so the Bible says that he picked up the knife, he stretched forth his hand, he took the knife and he was going to slay, butcher his son. Verse 11 says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. Now wait a minute, can I be honest? I think when he said that, there was a bit of excited rejoicing in his voice when he said it. 
Because I know if it had been me, I'd been like tore up from the floor up. My nerves would have been jacked out of the frame had this been going on. I mean, I'd have been all like... I'm sorry. You know, I'd have been tore up. I, I don't know if I'd have gone through with it. And then all of a sudden, the angel said, Abraham, Abraham. And he's like, whoo, right on time, God. Yes, can you help me? Please tell me I don't have to do this, right? I've been waiting, Lord. Hallelujah. Right, he had a glory spell right there on the spot. He's like, whoo, I thought it was going to happen, Lord. Wow, you know? We are legit now, Lord, right? I mean, this guy was messed up, and he was going to do it. He didn't care. He loved God that much. And you say, well, you know, you're just foolish to believe that. No, this is not a DC comic book. You're foolish not to believe it. Amen. The guy was going to butcher his kid because the Bible told him to. And he was going to obey what God's word was. And so he said, here am I. I love this verse 12. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither do thou anything unto him. For watch, please, the next phrase. Now I know. Didn't he know before? Yeah, but now Abraham knows. You see, God doesn't ask questions in the Bible because he needs the information. He does stuff and asks questions in the Bible because you need the information. Remember when he said this, Adam, where art thou? You think he was looking? No. He knew good and well that they had sinned, buck naked, hiding in a poison ivy patch. He knew exactly where they were. <laughs> so he wasn't asking because he needed to know. He was asking because Adam had to be honest about the fact that he had fallen and now his position with God was different. When he said, hey, Jacob, what is your name? Are you kidding me? Look at the text. He said his name two and a half verses earlier. <laughs> it wasn't about his name. It was about what his name meant. When he says in Mark chapter 5, who touched me? The disciples are like, are you kidding us? Everybody's touching you, Jesus. The building is packed beyond capacity. And the Bible said he spun around and saw her that had done this thing. He already knew who it was. And so in this context... He, he's not explaining himself away saying, wow, I didn't know before, but apparently I know now. What he is saying is this, now I'm of the understanding that you are of the understanding that nothing is going to come between our relationship, Abraham, and you love your kid so much you're willing to kill him. Now I'm going to use you to a whole new level that you could never imagine. Now I know, and now the world knows, that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son. Thine only son from me. The darling apple of the man's eye. He was in desperate love with this boy he had prayed for for years. And God said, now I know you love me more than you love him. Verse 13, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, I love this, behind him a ram caught in a thicket. In a thicket, a thorn bush behind his horns or by his horns. And Abraham went and he took the ram and he offered him up for a burnt offering in the, I love this, stead of his son. That sounds very gospel saturated. Because my Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You deserved it. He took it. And so in the stead of his son, he offered him there, verse 14, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. And it is said to this day, in the mount, you notice that? In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now track with me for a moment before we go back to verse number 10 and make our application and pray. Understand what just transpired. He said, I want you to go to the land of Moriah upon a mountain that I will tell thee of. And the Bible said he got up to go to the place. He saw the place. They got to the place. And then the Bible says, in that very spot that God specifically denoted as the destination of all destinations, not only was God futuristically going to provide himself as a lamb, but in that moment he provided for himself and he put a ram there caught in a thicket. Why does it matter where they were? Because if you study your Bible, you'll find out that the mountain of Moriah in the place was Mount Calvary. It was the exact same place where well into the future another lamb was caught by his head with a crown of thorns and he got up on a cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Bible says in Psalm chapter 22, and all of my bones are out of joint, but not a bone of him is broken. And Isaiah 53 proclaimed that Jesus had looked literally as if he had walked through a butcher's shop and he had no beauty that we should desire him. Right. I've heard people twist that passage. Jesus is so beautiful, you can never desire anymore. Doesn't say that. 
He was so wickedly beaten that you would not even desire to be in his company because he looked like a monster. And Jesus walked 450 yards down the Via Della Rosa, the streets of pain in Jerusalem, and every single drop of blood that hit that pavement that day, you could hear it whisper, this is the love of God for the world. This is the love of God for the world. And that's why my Bible says to flee from the wrath to come, because the only one to lift the veil of that wrath is Jesus Christ in his substitutionary atonement. And the Bible says in the very spot where Abraham then saw that ram caught in a thicket would be the place that God would say years later, his son, the Lord Jesus, would be the finality of the sacrificial system. Beautiful theology in this text, no doubt. But I need you to back up to verse 10 for a moment. We make our application. It's marked in my Bible that do you well to highlight this, circle this, do something with this verse. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. You see, at the end of the day, this story has very little to do with the slaying of Isaac and everything to do with the faith and obedience of his father Abraham. You see, I call this text the problem with Isaac because let me tell you what the problem was. The problem was God knew that Abraham loved Isaac more than anybody else and anything else. And God said, let's get right to the heart of the problem. Let's see if we got any idolatry in your heart, Abraham. The father of faith. You know, sometimes the American church, we're like, well, you know, I don't have a Swiss army pocket knife and I'm not whittling a Buddha statue and burning incense to it, so I'm not an idol worshiper. Really? If there's anything in your life that you won't give to God, it is your God. Whatever you want surrender to the Savior has become your Savior. When the Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, he understood that in our sophisticated mindset, listen, we've got the God of our making, the God of our understanding. We bow down to ourselves. That's why they call them selfies. They don't call them youfies. <laughs> We're addicted to ourselves in modern day Christianity. We call it American Christianity. It's far too American and not nearly enough Christians what the problem is. And ladies and gentlemen, we have to understand all of us in this room, including this guy with the microphone, we have some Isaacs that we're going to have to slay tonight. We got some stuff that's taking the place of God. My papa used to say, the throne of your heart ain't a two-seater. Hmm? My papa wasn't a preacher, but that'll preach right there. That'll hunt. The throne of your heart's not a two-seater. There's room for you or there's room for him, but there's not room for both. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, you have an option tonight. Aren't you glad for choices? Well, you've got one. You can declare Jesus Lord of your life right now because you want to, or you can call him Lord in the day of judgment because you have to, but you will bend your knee and you will call him Lord. There is no doubt about that fact. He is Lord. By the way, he's not Lord because I make him Lord. He was Lord long before I came around. And when my little pea-sized brain's cold, dead six feet in the ground and the world's on fire, he'll still be King of Kings and he'll still be Lord of Lords. And yet... We understand obedience. We understand the working of the Spirit of God, the promptings. We understand the Lordship of Christ. We know what the Bible teaches, and yet we're filled with Isaacs in this room right now. Your job can become your Isaac because you love it more than you love the things of God. Social media can become our Isaac. Because let's just be real honest about this right now, okay? Let's just have some short sleeve preaching. Let's just say it. I'm leaving the night, so no matter what I say. So listen to me. <laughs> In this room, including myself, I want you to think about the number of times you look at your Bible in one day compared to the number of times you look at your iPhone in one day. Now, they named it right. It's called an iPhone because you can't keep your dead gum eyes off of it. Look, 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 right? That's where we are. And we're like, oh, I'm not an idol worshiper. Yes, we are. We can go to a sporting event, scream our lungs out, spill popcorn and Pepsi all over our neighbor. They'll hug us for it and beg God for it to go into double overtime. But if the preacher go past 12 o'clock on Sunday, my goodness, we got to beat the church of God to the buffet. Are you kidding me? <laughs> right? 
Isn't that where we are? We're idol worshipers. We worship our kids. We worship our marriages. We worship our buildings. We worship all. Listen, we have more respect in America for our flag than we do for the word of Almighty God. Now don't misquote me. You can quote me, but I'm just here to tell you there's a lot of Isaacs in our life. And at the end of the day, it's not going to matter when the world's on fire. And I wonder tonight if we'd be willing to take a knife to it. For some of you, that's a relationship that you should have severed a long time ago. You say, well, it's just good in the making. Let me tell you what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communications corrupt good manners. I don't care how much you go to church and how much you pray and how much scripture you memorize. If you hang around the wrong crowd, you'll never turn out right and you'll never have gospel transformation because gravity tells you they'll pull you down quicker than you'll pull them up. Every single, a hundred times out of a hundred, that is the truth. Some of you got a knife, you better get it. You better sever some relationships. Now, I'm not talking about slicing up people you understand, praise God. <laughs> But you better get violent with yourself. You better take a good look in the mirror tonight and realize you've got some Isaacs and that's what keeps you from going to the next level in your life. You ever felt like, wow, you've just kind of reached a plateau and you can't get anywhere else? I'll tell you why. Because you've got an Isaac that'll never let you get to the next level until you kill him. Or at least until you're willing to. You see, we got this horrible misnomer of theology in the church today and we think, oh my goodness, if I give my life to God, he's going to call me to be a missionary, right? Which, by the way, if he does, you'll be the happiest person in the world. Well, if I give my life to God, he's going to take everything from me. Would you get over that nonsense? The question is not, if I surrender to God, will he take all my stuff? That's not the question. The question is, if he wants it, will you give it to him? That's the question. Not, will he take it? He may or may not. That's God's sovereign prerogative. He can do what he wants to. The question is, will you give it to him if he wants it? Will you walk away from that relationship? Will you quit that job because it's a spiritual hindrance to maturity in your life? Are you willing to relinquish something that you know has become such an idol in your life that you spend far more time with it and you worship it far more passionately than you do Jesus? That's all of us. For some of you, maybe sports. I'm not saying you got to cut sports out of your life altogether. I'm saying you better get a good, holy, healthy balance because your love of sports has trumped your love of the Bible and you can stay up all night and watch TV and not make one excuse to your boss to go in the next day, but you won't read the Bible and you won't pray and you'll stay up all night on Saturday and then give the preacher every excuse in the world for why you won't come to God's house. <laughs> right? Listen, I'm going to be honest with you. If some of you gave your boss the same lazy excuses for not coming to work that you give your pastor for not coming to church, he'd have fired your tail 10 years ago and you know it's the truth. Do you say, he said tail? Yeah, I said tail in the pulpit. Praise God, it'll be all right. I'm preaching, you're not. <laughs> I'm just telling you straight up, we got some Isaacs we got to slay tonight. But I'm going to tell you why many of us do not recognize them. We've become far too desensitized in our spirits. You ever noticed... Let me ask this question reverently tonight. How many of you in this room are over 65? Would you put your hand up? You're over 65? All right, good. A lot of you. Put your hand down, preacher. And, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll be 41 in May. I know that's not old by any stretch of the imagination. Older than him. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you're over 65, let me tell you what you know. You know right now we live in a nation you never expected. Oh, you talked about, it. oh, it's coming one day, it's coming one day. But let's be honest, you thought you'd be 100 or dead for 100 years before it ever happened. But we're in that day right now. And the church in America has become desensitized and unbothered by it. Listen, I'm all for technology. Good grief, I'm a high-tech redneck. I love technology. I'm not, we got 10 screens in our church, and I'm just kind of exaggerating, but we got six of them at least. I like, I like I'm not against it. But let me tell you what's happened in the church in America. All right, let's just get real about it. <laughs> Years ago, the world was right here, and the church was right here. I mean, we were far apart, but here's what's happened. The world has moved over here, and the church has moved right here. And the church today is just as worldly as the world used to be 30 years ago. And we're desensitized by it. I'll tell it like this, and we'll pray. How many of you have ever been to, let's be honest, Bean Blossom, Indiana? Anybody? Anybody ever heard of Bean Blossom, Indiana? Oh, one, two people have heard of it. Y'all need to get out of Roanoke, folks. Praise God. 
<laughs> some of you are like six hours away, but nonetheless, I was invited to go and preach years ago in evangelism at Bean Blossom Baptist Church. And the double whammy is it was pastored by a white guy named James Brown. Amen. And so here I am <laughs> preaching for James Brown at Bean Blossom Baptist Church. And it was an unbelievable meeting. Really, it was. I was there Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and I think all the way through Wednesday. But on the Sunday evening, as we were walking over, we, we pulled our big rig in and all that. But for some reason, my wife and I wouldn't have kids then. So for some reason, we stayed upstairs in the pastorium, in the, in the pastor's home. And his wife was an exquisite cook. He's still there to this day. And so we're up there and... Remember that tie I wore last night, that hot pink tie? I, I very rarely ever wear that, but my wife bought it for me that, that particular week. And so nothing screams preach like a hot pink preaching tie, right? <laughs> so we, we walked off the porch that night, and I had my tie on, and I had me a hot cup of coffee, and had my Bible tucked under my arm, and my wife was, was holding the, the bottom of my arm there on my wrist. And she was getting ready to sing and do the children's revival hour, and I had a brand new message. I tied a blue ribbon around, and I was ready to preach it, you know, three points in a poem, alliteration and all. So we were walking from the pastorium over uh, to the church, a little less distance than, than where the pastor lives now, and it was just a flat little land. And so we're walking over, and I hadn't paid any attention the other day or so that I'd been there. I had paid no attention whatsoever. But right across the little road, what we'd call a road, it was like a tiny little path to them. But right across the road were these huge, like 15 of these huge metal buildings, long metal buildings. And I hadn't paid any attention because the wind hadn't been shifting right. But that east wind shifted and they were hog killing buildings. Yeah, that's what I thought. There's some stuff that stinks, but them jokers stank, you understand. <laughs> I don't mean hog, H-O-G, I mean hog, H-A-W-G. If you knew what went a Jimmy Dean sausage patty, it wouldn't be on your plate in the morning, I guarantee you. <laughs> That'd mess a kill you. And so when that wind shifted, I'm telling you, you ever smelled a hog farm? Woo! Repulsiveness with a capital R, you understand. One of the most awful, wicked, vile, devilish, pit-filled smells that you could ever imagine made its way into my nostrils. You ever smelled something so bad that when you smelled it, it embedded itself in your mouth and you could taste it? <laughs> That's a horrible smell, right? I forgot about that sermon. I forgot about that stupid tie. I forgot about holding my wife's hand. I forgot about that blue ribbon message. I forgot about all of it. I said, Brother Brown, <laughs> what in the world is that horrible smell? He didn't bat an eye, look at a note card, and take a breath. He said, what smell, son? <laughs> and dude was being truthful. Because I learned something. You live in a hog farm, it ain't long till hogs don't stink anymore. And the church in America has lived in sin so long, it don't stink to us anymore, ladies and gentlemen. And the world can smell us, but we can't smell them. And there's something wrong with that in the church house. Because we're full of Isaacs. We love our money. We love our cars. We love our houses. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. But in America, stuff has us. We buy stuff we don't need with money we ain't got to improve to impress neighbors who don't care. Amen. Pull out them little plastic genies. <laughs> well, you know, brother Locke, I got a key up with the Joneses. Let me tell you something about the Joneses. They're broke. They just won't tell you. <laughs> well, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. That's because the Holy Spirit says you are lazy. Get up and water your own lawn. Amen. <laughs> Quit coveting and lusting after everything you don't have and start rejoicing in what you do have because God's no, never going to give you a lot of bit if you can't handle a little bit. I'm going to win the lottery one day and I'm going to give $100 million to the church. No, you won't. Money will change you. Let me tell you why I know most people would never give a fortune to the church because they have $100 in their pocket that the preacher ain't got in six years. And they talk about, oh, I'm going to give something that I ain't got. It's always easy to give something that you don't have. What I'm finding is it's easier to give stuff away when it doesn't belong to you. I could give your stuff away all day long. <laughs> Never lose a sleep about it. <laughs> but here's the point. God owns everything you have. It should be easy to give it to others and be a blessing to the kingdom of God. And so at the end of the day, we have a hard time picking up those knives, slaying our attitudes, some of you have an idol of bitterness because you got a jacked up re relationship that went awry a long time ago and you enjoy it and you don't want peace. And God says, you better pick that knife up and kill that anger. You better slay that temper. You better slay that arrogance, that pride. You better slay all that foolishness and nonsense going on in your house between you and your spouse. Your kids are seeing that. You better take a knife to it. You see the application tonight? 
There's so many things that we love, and God knows what it is. Whether I know, whether you know, God knows. And there's going to be those times in our life that God says, I wonder if you're willing to go where I want you to go and do what I want you to do. Where I lead you, will you follow? What I feed you, will you swallow? And will you take a knife to your Isaac? Because Jesus put it this way. In Luke chapter 14, a whole bunch of people showed up at the meeting. But before the invitation was given, more than half of them were gone. Because Jesus was pretty straight doc doctrinally in the way that he talked. And they couldn't handle it. Because here's what Jesus said three times. If you don't love me more than any other person, you cannot be my disciple. If you don't love me more than any other place, you cannot be my disciple. And if you don't love me more than any other possession, you cannot be my disciple. Greg didn't say that. God did. He didn't say you couldn't be a Christian. He just said you can't be a real follower. And I know a lot of people that have walked an aisle, signed a card, prayed a prayer, joined a church, but they are no follower of Jesus Christ because they're not willing to forsake all. And when I read as Paul was coming to the end of his life, he said in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if I, by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I'd already attained either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, not 15 things I dabble in. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press agonizama, I agonize, I sweat, bleed, strain, I pray, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect or mature in our faith be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. What Paul was saying in that context is this. Yes, all of us want the power of God in a magnificent way, but the process to get to that power is a super difficult, painful process. And he even said earlier in that same passage, he said, I count all things but dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. So let me say it and we'll pray. You've got to get out of your mind tonight that serving Jesus Christ is going to cost you something. It is not. Serving Jesus Christ is going to cost you everything. And tonight, it's time to get a knife and take it to Isaac. Father, thank you.